All right, can everyone see my screen okay? Good, thank you. Uh, well, so thank you for having me here today. My name is Erin Bishop. I am the Outreach Coordinator with the Oahu Invasive Species Committee. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat and then I'll ask Morgan if you see anything that comes up, uh, please feel free to stop me. And then at the end, we can have a little bit of a talk story. I do have quite a few slides, but they'll go kind of quickly. And what I just want to get into today is a little bit of an overview about invasive species in Hawaii. Um, I'll talk about three of our target species that based on what you do and where you work, you could possibly come into contact with these species. And these are all invasive species that have an early detection rapid response efforts underway on Oahu. And then I'll talk a little bit about some common invasives. I know that some of the people had um, questions about how to identify invasive trees, what to do about invasive trees. So I'll cover a little bit about that at the end and give you guys some uh, resources to help you while you're in the field to try and look up and identify some of these plants that you might be finding in people's yards. Um, a little bit about myself, I've been in Hawaii since 2010. I went to Hawaii Pacific University and I've worked for OIS since um, 2013. So um, if you all have any questions about invasive species, please feel free to ask those on and do my best to answer them. So just a little bit of background, especially for you folks while you're out in the field, you may get questions from the general public about what is a native species versus what's an invasive species. The easiest way to uh, define this for people is that native species arrive without the help of human beings. Um, and that was either by the wind, wing, or wave. Most plants in Hawaii arrived with the help of birds. And then once they were able to establish and survive on the islands, they were then spread around further by things like wind and water and more birds. There are two types of native species in Hawaii. There's endemic, that means they're found here and nowhere else. And we have um, a high rate of endemicism in Hawaii just based on our geographic area. That means that the plants and animals that were able to make it all the way out here in the middle of the Pacific and actually survive and thrive, they developed very specific characteristics and they actually evolved into new species. And then we also have indigenous species and those are native plants and animals that you um, can find here in Hawaii, but other places in the world. Invasive species and non-native species. Um, so we have a lot of non-native species. This is any plant or animal that arrived with the help of human beings, whether that's on purpose or on accident, but just because it's non-native doesn't necessarily mean that it's invasive. Plumeria trees are not native to Hawaii, but you can plant one in your backyard and 20 years later, it's not taking over your neighborhood. However, the octopus tree that you see there on the right is highly invasive. Both of these are landscaping plants. They were introduced through the landscaping and horticulture industry, but octopus trees, especially on the windward slopes of the Southern Ko'ala Mountains, you're gonna see these kind of taking over, highly invasive. So the answer is not all non-native species are invasive. Um, and this is a question that we get a lot, especially with urban forestry. A lot of people don't wanna see anything that's not native planted in the urban forestry landscape. It would be wonderful if we could have all native trees in our urban landscapes. Um, sometimes though, the habitat and conditions are not suitable for native species. So after a native species, uh, we recommend a non-invasive one. So all of these are examples of non-native species, but they're good examples of things that don't cause harm and they're actually beneficial. So what exactly makes a non-native species um, sort of cross over into that invasive category? And it's a very specific definition. It's a non-native species that has to harm one or multiple areas of our economy, health, environment, and here in Hawaii, we also consider quality of life. The worst of the worst invasive species harm all four of these categories. So when we think of something like um, mosquitoes, they're one of the world's worst invasive species. They kill more people than anything else on the planet. And they are highly detrimental to our economy. So when we do find um, invasive species, especially mosquitoes that are vectors for things like dengue fever, um, this happens on Hawaii Island. They have to put a lot of money into that to do mosquito abatement. It's also harmful to our health. And that's also how we spend our money and in, in ensuring that we get the proper medicine when we do get these diseases. 
Mosquitoes are also really detrimental to our environment because our native birds are highly susceptible to mortality um, when they get avian malaria spread by mosquitoes. And then our quality of life, um, I'm sure many of you have spent time out in the forest and whether it's day or night, if you're out in the forest, if you get into a thick patch of mosquitoes, it can drive you crazy. The characteristics for invasive species are that they can live in just about any kind of habitat. You'll find rats downtown Waikiki at 10 o'clock at night, but if you go up into the forest, they're also feeding on native seeds and native birds. They reproduce very quickly, making lots of seeds or having a lot of offspring. They outcompete for resources. Strawberry guava is a good example of this. It's a shade tolerant tree. That means it can invade native forest um, as well as your neighborhoods. And they really don't have any predators or natural enemies to keep them in check. So when we think about ungulates other than people, we don't have any top predators or any diseases here in Hawaii that help keep those populations down. There's a lot of different organizations in Hawaii that work on invasive species. Basically every state agency and organization has some sort of invasive species management built into their mission statement. So when we think about Hawaii State Department of Health, they're concerned with invasive species like rats and mosquitoes that are vectors for disease. The Board of Water Supply is concerned with invasive plants that are gonna threaten the integrity of the forested watersheds, their ability to collect and store water, which is how the only way we get our water is from our forests. And then other places like Department of Transportation, they're concerned with invasive plants, um, especially things like albizia trees. So after Hurricane Azel, the response was really hindered by the fact that people had to try and make their way through all these um, tons and tons of fallen albizia trees that were blocking access and making it unable to get um, electricity back to those people on Big Island. One of the things that we consider with invasive species, and we hear this a lot, especially when we call people to survey their yard for invasive species, they'll say, well, I don't think I have that plant, but you know what I have a ton of? Um, I've got a lot of strawberry guava. The issue with invasive species is that over time, um, invasive species will spread. And once they get to a widespread status, the cost of managing those invasive species can be exorbitant. Um, organizations like OIS, we have a staff right now of 11 people and an operating budget of just over a million dollars a year. And that's nowhere near enough to target plants and animals like albizia and rats. So that's where you really get into the state mandated agencies that work on protecting sensitive areas from things like strawberry guava and rats. There's no way to do an island-wide eradication. So the best place to work in invasive species is those early stages. That's where you have the money and the resources to try and eradicate it before it starts spreading and causing these really widespread impacts. And so that is where the ISTs operate. So the invasive species committees, we are um, many. We are county-based. So there's a BISC, a MISC, a MOMISC, an OISC, and a KISC. The reason for this is, like I said before, we target invasive species that are not yet widespread. So um, we look for things that are going to cause the worst impact, and our goal is for to do um, island-wide eradications or localized eradications in very sensitive areas. The reason we have different ones for each county is because we have different invasive species issues. So for instance, if you're in Hilo and you hear koki frogs, you can call BISC, but because they're everywhere and widely established on Hawaii Island and unlikely to be eradicated, BISC is not going to go out and catch those frogs. But if you hear one on Oahu, you can call us and we'll work with the Department of Agriculture to go out and capture and remove those frogs. Mongoose is another example of this. Um, they're widespread on Oahu, but they're not widespread on Kauai. So if you were on Kauai and saw a mongoose, KISC is going to go out and capture that animal and remove it from the environment. I don't expect everyone to know what plants are where and how distributed they are. The great thing is you don't have to know. There is a statewide pest reporting hotline, so you can call the phone number, but they've also come out recently with an online reporting system at 643pest.org. And even better for you folks while you're in the field, there is a free smartphone app that you can download to your phone. You can upload pictures, you can drop a point on a map. It doesn't matter if it's something that you think maybe, oh, I've seen it several times, probably nobody cares about it doesn't matter, they don't get um, too many reports. So you can report anything and this works statewide. 
This map, um, you don't really need to look and see like which icons are for which species. This is just to give you an idea of where OISC works on the island. And what I'd like for you to notice about the map is you see a lot of these points are in highly developed residential or urban areas. The reason for that is like I said, we target plants and animals that aren't widespread yet. And if you remember, invasive species are introduced and usually spread through human activity. So we work a lot with these invasive species at their points of entry, which is in these highly developed urban and residential areas. So I'll talk about three target species that I think you folks might come in contact with um, and that we really want you to report. The first being rapid ohia death. So if you click on your icon, if you wanna click on your hand and I can see how many people have heard about this or are familiar with this issue. It's pretty recent in Hawaii. See a couple people, yeah, a couple. Yeah, this is one of these um, invasive species issues that is highly, um, it has a lot of impacts to our native forest um, in more ways than one. Just because it kills ohia trees, that's not where it ends. This is a fungus that is new to Hawaii. It's just recently detected and um, it only attacks our ohia trees. Now, it's not like Big Island. When you're on Oahu, you don't see a whole lot of ohia trees in people's yards. Um, not like you do on Big Island. You can go to the Walmart in Big Island and find ohia trees in the parking lot. It's not really something you see here on Oahu that much, but we do have quite a bit of ohia here. Um, ohia is highly variable. It can grow from sea level up to 9,000 feet. And it's one of these most important keystone species to our forests. It's the dominant tree in all of our native forests on every island. There's over 850,000 acres of ohia forests, and over half of that is on Hawaii Island. Now, what's killing them is a fungus, and it's new to science. When they found this out, they were able to identify it in 2014. It had never been seen before when they did their genetic studies. We found that there are two strains of this fungus and they now have Hawaiian names because they had never been seen. The first one is called Ceratocystis luku ohia. Luku means to destroy and that's the most aggressive and it's the one causing the most mortality. The less aggressive is called Ceratocystis huli ohia and it generally presents itself as like a canker or a knot on a branch. Um, and however, it, it will eventually kill the tree. It just happens much slower. Now this is a fungus that attacks the, attacks the sapwood of the tree. So the sapwood is where all of the water and nutrients are transported throughout the tree. The fungus will grow in that sapwood and eventually it chokes off that movement of water and nutrients. And then that's why you get these rapid browning of the crowns and the branches. And it happens so quickly that the leaves will stay on the tree. So it's a fungus that you're not gonna see on the leaves. You don't see it on the tree. You don't see it on the bark. The way it gets into the tree is that it has to have a wound. So if there's a wound in the bark and the fungal spores land on that wound, it can start to grow into the sapwood. The way that we know that it moves around is humans. Um, and that's because we move around post, ohia logs, ohia firewood that will have the fungus in it. That fungus can be viable in those logs as long as there's some moisture in there for up to five years that we know of, possibly even longer. It also moves around because of boring beetles. These are ambrosia beetles. There's um, many different species of ambrosia beetles here in Hawaii. Some are native, some are endemic, um, and some are invasive. What happens is these beetles will bore through the wood and as they go through it, they go through the sapwood. And what they do is they kick out what's called frass. So it's beetle waste and also shavings from the wood. The fungal spores, active fungal spores can be on those shavings and then those get blown around in the wind. We also know that live spores can be present in the soil. Um, so that's why cleaning your shoes um, and doing that 70% alcohol spray on your boots after you've been in a forest is important because it'll kill fungal spores so that you're not introducing it into a new place. So as I said before, wounds are where the um, fungus enters into the tree. So the best thing that we can do is not wound a tree. 
And the new research that's coming out of Big Island is they're finding that forested plots that are fenced off and have ungulate removal are seeing less incidence of rod infected trees. And that's because ungulates will wound trees, cattle, goats, um, pigs. They also strip the bark from the tree. They rub it against it and it creates these big wounds. And when you have a lot of fungal spores in the area, they will infect the tree that way. The symptoms of rod um, present themselves as, like I said, those dead leaves on top of a tree. The entire tree doesn't have to be a, um, dead. It can just be one branch with brown leaves attached, or it can be the entire crown. Doesn't necessarily mean that rod is present in that tree. There's other things that can affect ohia, but the only way for us to know is for us to go in and get a sample of that sapwood and send it to the lab to be tested for the fungal presence. So I'll just go through some pictures that'll show you what rod suspect symptomatic trees look like. You'll see um, oftentimes they'll be surrounded by healthy trees, but it will look like it's dead or dying and those brown leaves are attached. It's pretty prevalent and it's highly noticeable because those red trees, especially um, on a cloudy day, stand out pretty well. So these are all rod symptoms of trees on Big Island. But like I said, other things can cause the same symptoms. So when you do too much herbicide or weed whacking, um, ohia is a little bit sensitive, so it can be injured. Sometimes the tree will recover, sometimes not. But like I said, we can't tell without um, going in and getting a sample of the wood. So as you're out and about and doing your surveys and counting trees, if you see ohia trees with brown leaves attached, whether it's a branch or the entire tree, it could be a seedling that's only four feet tall, it could be a 25 foot tree. We ask that you report that to us or you can use that 643 pest app. We contact the homeowner and then we go out and we take a sample of that tree. So where is rod? Um, in the state, Hawaii Island and Kauai have both strains of the rod fungus. They have that really aggressive leucohia and the less aggressive huliohia. Maui and Oahu have only had detections of huliohia, the less aggressive, and there's been no detections of rod on Molokai or Lanai. Um, here's a map showing you where rod is located, where we've detected it on Oahu. Those three windward points that you see, those are all residential detections. And those are people calling us saying my tree's dying or it's dead and it has the red leaves attached. The other detections that you see, um, most of those are on summits and two of those are along trail sides. So like I said, this is the less aggressive one. It possibly has been in Hawaii for decades. We only noticed it though, because we started looking for the Lukuohia because those trees die rapidly, like within two weeks. The, the less aggressive Huliohia, it can take years for the tree to die and not a lot of people notice that. So what we're trying to do right now is monitor. We really don't wanna have to deal with the Lukuohia. Um, the way we deal with the rod infected trees is we will fell the tree if we can do so safely and not injure any other Ohia in the area. And then we tarp it to allow those fungal spores to not be spread in the wind column. The good news is that most of our ohia forests are still healthy. There's a lot of dead trees out there. There's um, still research going on into finding out if there's resistant species of ohia that can stand and not die and, and submit to rod. We have five species of ohia here in Hawaii. One of those is the polymorpha, which is highly variable. So there's 11 varieties of that species. So there's still a lot of ongoing work. Um, the things that we ask people to do is number one, don't injure ohia trees. Um, don't transport ohia inter island. Don't move ohia wood. So if you happen to cut down your ohia tree, don't give it to someone in some other part of the island for them to burn or build with. We just want to make sure that there is no ohia fungus in that. And then when you go hiking, making sure that um, you are cleaning your gear and your tools. You want to get all of the soil off of your shoes. That's the biggest thing. And then afterwards, you can spray it with just that isopropyl alcohol that you get at Long's. It's $2 a bottle. That's gonna kill the fungal spores and you only have to leave it on your shoes, the bottom of your shoes for about 10 seconds. And then at the very end, it doesn't really happen a whole lot here on Oahu, but if you do go off-roading, make sure that you wash your vehicle and make sure that it's free of all um, soil and dirt before you go somewhere else on the island. 
There is a website. It's got lots of information and they keep it pretty updated. That's a rapidokiadeath.com. I'm sorry, .org. And um, you can visit that and it's going to give you even more information. The next one is little fire ants. This is um, something you may have seen in the news. It was first detected in 2013 on Oahu. This is an ant that's native to um, South and Central America. Um, from there, it moved to Florida. And then from Florida, it moved to Big Island on a shipment of palm trees. Once they figured out it was on Big Island, um, they couldn't, they, there was no research done on these ants. They didn't know how to control them. They didn't know much about the biology. So on Big Island, they're pretty widespread and highly unlikely to be eradicated. But on the other islands, um, through the movement of plant material and other things, they started to pop up. We have no native ants here in Hawaii and there's over 60 species now. Um, lots of different ants. Most people have about three different kinds of ants in their house alone, in your yard, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, you're gonna find different ants, they're everywhere. A lot of people say, what's the big deal about this ant? Why do we care about this little fire ant? And that's because it's one of the world's worst invasive species. Now we do have fire ants, there's different types. Um, the most common one that we have here in Hawaii is the tropical fire ant. So if you're at a park or a beach and you're just standing there minding your own business in the parking lot, maybe next to a trash can, you start to get bit or stung on your ankles and you find out it's ants, it's the tropical fire ant. They're a larger ant, they like hot, sunny, dry areas. But the little fire ant is something people don't often see until they get stung by it. They're very small. They're only as long as a penny is thick. They're very slow moving. The reason they're so devastating is because they live on the ground and in the trees, which makes it very difficult to get rid of them once you have them. Um, and also they don't hang on to the trees very well. So if you are working underneath of a tree and it's infested with little fire ant, any small breeze is gonna knock about 30 fire ants down onto your neck and into your elbows and on your shirt and that's when you get stung. They like it where it's damp and shady. So they're a big threat to our forested watersheds and everything that lives in them. They're impactful to our health because they have a really nasty sting. And because they build up these really dense colonies, when people get stung, they don't get stung by one ant. Like I said, they get stung by several tens, 20, 30 ants at a time. They also are protein eaters, um, which means that they are meat eaters. So they seek out um, moist, soft body parts. And so what they're seeing on Big Island, especially in areas that are highly infested, a lot of the animals that spend time outside end up coming out with these clouded corneas. And so if you look at these pets, you'll see these you know, clouded eyes that they have. And that's due to getting stung in their eyes by little fire ants. They're also impactful for our environment. We already have ground nesting birds that are a threat by um, things like crazy, crazy ants. Little fire ants are not only a threat to ground nesting native birds, but because they are an arboreal ant, they like to live up in the trees. They're a threat to our native birds, which are already under a lot of stress by habitat loss and mosquitoes. They're also a threat to our native insects because they will eat insects as well. And then to our economy, agriculture is under threat by this ant, especially if you have, um, a, let's say a coffee farm or if you grow lychee and it's organic. Um, some of the, the treatment methods um, are not uh, organically um, approved. So you have to do things on a slower level and a slower pace. You're also not gonna be able to export your goods if they have little fire ant. California is not gonna accept them. And a lot of things like cut flowers make their way out of Hawaii to generate an income for farmers. And then tourism is an issue too. A lot of our um, natural places, should they get infested with little fire ant, we would absolutely have to treat those areas because no one's gonna visit them if every time you go, you're gonna be getting stung on your neck and your face by little fire ants. It will have to be something that they control. And then just our basic quality of life here in Hawaii, we're blessed with uh, the weather. We can stay outside 12 months out of the year. A lot of people do that. Um, if your yard is infested with little fire ants, you will have to treat it. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to spend time out there without getting stung. On Oahu, um, we have had many detections. So 16 active sites are currently undergoing treatment. 
There are six that have already undergone treatment. And once they undergo the treatment, they have to monitor those areas for years to come just to make sure that they got rid of all of the colonies. This is not a control effort here on Oahu. This is an eradication effort. So it's a long treatment process. It's a, over the course of a year. And it's eight treatments over the course of a year. After a year, they go into a monitoring phase for at least five years to make sure no ants pop back up. What we are asking people to do is to report any suspect ants. We would like it for everyone to collect and submit ants at least once a year on their property. The easiest way many people have already heard about it is the peanut butter chopstick test. You put a little bit of peanut butter on coffee stirs or chopsticks, put them out in your yard in damp and shady areas, wait an hour, pick it up, and then any ants, you put them in a Ziploc bag, freeze them and mail them, mail them in for um, identification. This is all part of an early detection rapid response measure that's going on um, statewide, but especially here on Oahu, we're concerned with new detections that keep popping up. For more information about this, you can go to stoptheant.org and they're gonna have all of the specific details on how to collect your ants and where to mail them to for each island. And then the last target species I'll talk about is the coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, so I realize that you guys are out there looking at trees and monitoring trees. Um, coconut rhinoceros beetle is a nocturnal beetle. It's native to Southeast Asia. It showed up here in 2013. Because it's nocturnal, many people don't see the beetle, but you're gonna see the damage to palm trees. So that's why I wanted to talk about this guy. It's the largest beetle that we have on the island. It's two inches long, so think about it being as long as your thumb. It's also dark brown to black, and it has this horn on it that gives it a rhinoceros name. Both male and females will have that horn. And the adults cause damage to the palm trees. The damage that people will see are these holes at the base of palm fronds up in the crown. So the adult beetles will bore into the crown of the tree and they feed on the young leaves of the palm tree because of the sap. Once those leaves open up, you start to see these what are called V cuts. Um, and this represents about six months of damage, but it's really visible. So when you're looking at palm trees, coconut palm trees, date palms, fan palms, you start to see these V cuts and um, or notches in the leaves. And this is something you definitely want to report. There is a lookalike for this beetle. It's the oriental flower beetle. It's also invasive, but it's been here since 2012 and it's widely established. It hangs out during the day, it likes tomato plants, it likes uh, mangoes and avocados. It's an agricultural pest. When you see them side by side, you think, oh, they don't really look that much alike. The oriental flower beetle does not have that horn. It's about half the size and it's got these gold flecks on its back. The lookalikes really come from the larva. Now the larva look very similar. Um, the coconut rhinoceros beetle, however, when you pull it out of the dirt and you let it settle and you wait for it to move, it stays on its side and crawls in a C shape. So think C shape, coconut, call someone. The oriental flower beetle, if you leave it alone, wait for it to calm down, it's gonna flip over on its back with its legs in the air and crawl away that way. If you're ever unsure, you can report it not a problem, they will come out and inspect that. The larvae don't live in the trees, they're generally going to be living in mulch and compost piles. This map shows where they've had trap detection. So these are positive CRB trap detections. And you can see that the core of the infestation is really down here in the central southern part of the island and kind of making its way up into the central part by Mililani. The hot spots are really Pearl City Peninsula and Iroquois Points. Um, so these are areas where you're gonna see a lot of these traps, these black traps hanging in the trees. Um, but if you see that damage to any palm tree, those V cuts, that's really what you want to report. You can use the 643 Pest app um, and you can also visit crbhawaii.org. That is the website for the CRB response. Coconut rhinoceros beetle is only present on Oahu at this point, and they wanna make sure that it stays that way. They wanna stop the spread across the island, but also make sure that it doesn't get to other islands. So some of the common invasive trees, this is probably things that you all are really familiar with. African tulip tree is something that you're gonna see out there. This is um, a highly invasive tree. It's one of the world's worst horticultural trees but widely established. There's no agency that works on this tree. 
Albizia trees are another one that are highly common. They were introduced to Hawaii in the early 1900s to try and do some reforestation projects. Um, what was happening is that a lot of the sugarcane plantations were losing water due to deforestation and a lot of the water not being captured by the streams. So they started a reforestation project. They found out Albizia grows really well, really quickly, um, and it hangs on to the soil. Uh, but what they didn't know was how invasive it is. Here in Hawaii, it's the fastest growing tree on the planet. We grow about 10 feet a year. So the best way to manage Albizia right now is if you see small trees, remove them before they get too big. Once they get large, like 100 feet, they're really difficult to uh, remove and they're costly to do so. There is an organization that's working on this. Um, it's the Ko'olau Mountain Watershed Partnership. What they're working on is albizia removal and wild areas because they can do it cheaply and safely. So what they'll do is they inject the tree either with herbicide or they will ring bark it. So they cut a ring around the base of the tree so that it can't move any water. And within five years, it dies. It's a very effective and like I said, cost, um, cost effective way to remove these trees. However, it's not something that you can really do in a residential area because you cannot safely have a dead standing 100 foot albizia tree. Um, those limbs are going to fall down and cause uh, injury to people, um, but also issues with um, roads and houses and things. Ardesia elliptica, this is also called shoe button or inkberry. This is um, a smaller tree, it doesn't get very big, but this is something you see very common on roadsides. This is also something that you would want to remove and recommend that people remove as soon as it starts showing up on their property. This is something like strawberry guava that once it gets in there, you're just gonna get thickets and stands of it and it really takes over spaces. The autograph tree, this is something that's really common. You see it in parking lots. Uh, a lot of people will carve their names in this. This is um, an invasive tree that's often used in landscaping, but nobody responds to it because it's so well established. Bing and Bing is something that no one also responds to, but this is an interesting plant. We see it a lot along stream beds. You'll see it windward Oahu. Manoa is really bad with it, um, but we get kind of a lot of calls about this because it's starting to, it moves. So it kind of makes its way into neighborhoods and people probably have never seen it before. And they say, what's this new plant? It's not really new. It's been here for a long time. It's just slowly spreading across the island. And this is also one that we recommend people remove but it's not something that any agency um, will go after. There's just not enough resources. And then the dreaded koa haole or haole koa. This is something you see along the coastal areas. Um, it creates these monotypic areas. There's really nothing else that grows in them. It's a highly invasive plant, but widely established. And then the dreaded octopus tree. So if you, uh, somebody says, so, a lot of people think it's pretty, they like it in their yard. Uh, but it is spread so easily by birds. It makes 800,000 seeds every single year, and it's moving its way up um, into the mountainsides, but it creates these monotypic forests um, that aren't good at holding soil and also not good for collecting water. But like I said, this is widely established. No one works on this outside of keeping it out of sensitive areas. Intact native forests is where someone's going to work on this. So those are common invasives. I'm sure you probably are all really familiar with, but you might be like, what is this plant? I've never seen this before. Is it bad? Is it good? I don't know. Um, one of the favorite books that I have is this Trailside Plants in Hawaii. It's an easy to use reference guide. It has it organized by um, coastal, mesic, dry areas. And then it also further categorizes it into uh, vines, shrubs, trees, herbaceous plants. And it's pretty much everything that you'll probably see in a residential or urban area. The other thing that you can do is visit this website. This is uh, Star Environmental. This is a wonderful compilation of many plants, even insects in Hawaii. Now, Forrest and Kim Star are biologists that are based on Maui and they are early detection botanists. Um, they go around and they do basically inventories along the roadsides. A lot of this is Maui centric. However, because the plants that you are seeing, mostly the common invasive plants are gonna be things that are kind of widespread, meaning they're on islands. Chances are you'll be able to find your plants here. The next thing is if you find your plant, you figure out what it is, but you still don't know if it's bad or good. Forest and Kim Star, they have everything. They've got native plants, non-native invasive, and they don't really um, categorize it. 
that way. So you can go to plantpono.org. This is a website that uses what's called the weed risk assessment to give a number based on the risk that it has to become weedy in Hawaii. This is a new tool that's out in the past 10 years. And had we had had it 50 years ago, we probably wouldn't have some of the issues with plants that we have today. I did um, a very small screenshot of how to walk through this and I hope it's not too boring, but um, this is generally, oops, sorry. This is the way, if I can get it to play. This is the way that we do it um, when we find a plant we don't know. So we'll go to the STAR environmental website. And once you're there, you can click on the free resources button. They have, if you don't know your plant, you can go to the free identification. This is the Hawaii plant ID. This um, will take you to a Flickr account. And this is a very active account. There's over 480 members that are active on this account. There's over 3,500 photos of plants that are in Hawaii. And what you can do, you can post your image and ask for someone to identify it. And then if you're really good at plants, you can even help identify some of the plants they don't know. There's a lot of botanists, um, there's entomologists that are on this site. A lot of scientists that work in the field are active on that Flipper site. If you know your plant, you can just go to Plants of Hawaii. This is the entire catalog of everything that they've looked at. And this is by scientific name, common name, and the family. So let's say you said somebody, oh, I heard about this plant, Macaranga. So you kind of type in Macaranga. To note, uh, you have to spell it right. This is not gonna auto-correct your spelling. <laughs> so if you spell it wrong, nothing's gonna come up. So make sure that you spell correctly. And it's gonna come up with, oh, there's two different species of Macaranga. So you can sort of scroll through the photos. And once you find one, you think, oh yeah, I think that's it. I've seen that somewhere. And you can click on the photo and it's gonna tell you what species it is. So for instance, this one's the Macaranga Mapa. And this is the common one that we're seeing here on Oahu. And if you click on it, it comes up with all the images that are on Oahu. So you can click on some of those to confirm it. Yeah, that's definitely the plant. And then because you can see, it doesn't really tell you if it's good or bad, right? Then you can take that name and you go to Plant Pono. When you're on the Plant Pono website, this box in the front, this is just to find the good plants. So if you type in Macaranga, it's probably not gonna come up. That's just if you wanna find good plants for your yard. You have to make sure you go down to that bottom left-hand corner and type it in. And it will auto-populate with the species of Macaranga that have been evaluated. So there's our Macaranga Mapa. We can see that it does have a high risk. It's a score of 11. And you can even download the assessment and it will download as an Excel sheet. And you can open that up and look at all of the 48 questions that they ask about this plant. Is it shade tolerant? Is it spread by birds? Is it poisonous? Is it uh, bad for agriculture? They evaluate the plants based on 48 characteristics, and then that's how they get the score. So that's pretty much the overview that I have for you folks. Um, if you have any questions, you can always contact me at oscathawaii.edu. Um, you can call our office number, and I'm happy to, if I can't answer it, I will get you in touch with the people who can. And um, you can also visit our website at oahuis.org to look at some of our other target species um, to make sure that you're a little bit familiar about it. These are all the species that we want reported on because we're looking for them and we're looking for them to get rid of them. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has questions, please feel free. Sorry, I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, that was great, Erin, thank you. Yeah. So does anybody, um, have you all seen ohia trees while you're out in the field, in yards? Yeah, I don't think they come across them all that often. I think Kailua saw a lot. Um, Caroline, has your group come across a lot of ohia? I, our group, not so much. I don't think Larry's on. He can probably say so too. But for me, I hike a lot. And yeah. we see Ohia death up high. And we see a lot of the, the misery um, over in the hikes on the 
kind of the south above Paradise um, Palisades area, and then Nuuanu area. We've seen some, but uh, it's that was interesting to see the different types. And I think one of the things we can do for us is bring alcohol and clean our feet, you know, clean our boots. I mean, I can just make our group aware of that because it's that that could stop some of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And for your reference, we um, OS flies all of the Ohia forest on Oahu twice a year. And as we fly, we've got um, this new technology where we're able to take GPS points while we hover over a tree. And then if it's a suspect tree, we take those GPS points and give them to our field crew. And then our field crew goes out and we collect the samples. So since this all began for Oahu, when our first detection happened, we've actually surveyed and sampled over 370 trees. So we have eight positive detections. Um, so a lot of the trees that we sample We'll still come to other things. Um, you know, there's a, a rust that affects Ohia, drought affects Ohia, age will affect Ohia. So a lot of things kill Ohia. Um, but like I said, until we can get that sapwood, um, that's the only way we can have a positive detection. And we can take samples as long as the branch is as thick as a thumb. So that means seedlings that are only maybe like three feet tall, we can take samples for those and get um, a pretty good lab a lab specimen for them to test. So even small ohia, if you see dead ohia with um, the dead leaves attached, yeah, report that to us and we'll contact the homeowners and get a sample. Most people are really um, happy to cooperate with that effort. All right, any other questions? Peter, you have a question? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks so much, Erin, um, for taking the time to talk to us. It's really informative and a, and a great presentation. Um, but uh, I think it was Caroline used the word misery, and it's hard not to like fall into that trap after you know um, listening to all this. And I know you work with it every day. So what what gives you hope, or like what what keeps you, yeah, what gives you hope? Um, for Rod specifically. For yeah, I mean your title is invasive <laughs> species and, and the like, uh, extinction capital of the world, and it's just like it's easy to curl up in a fetal position and just give up completely. But um, yeah, you go into this job every single day. I don't. So like, yeah, what can I? Yeah, how, what? I don't know. Yeah, the the things that give us hope. Um, and I speak for myself, but I I think maybe a broader thing for a lot of conservation organizations is that we um there's sort of an urgency to it. Uh, there's so much of what we do and how we operate as humans in Hawaii that is um, dependent on the efficiency and function of our forested watersheds, all of our water that we get. It, I mean, it affects our near shore reefs. If we have high erosion events, it's flooding. It, it's, there's an urgency to make sure that we're taking action. So, um, that's one thing that leads us to hope. The other thing that leads us to hope, especially um, within the ISC, is when we do have these, these small eradications and we have winds. So for example, here on Oahu, um, we've eradicated this, um, this invasive plant called fireweed twice. And if you've ever been to Maui, no. yeah, that's a nasty, nasty weed, especially for pastures. Um, it's toxic and can be fatal to livestock and it's taking over pasture lands. So, yeah, from them, yeah, on the yeah. Oh, so you're very familiar. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah, it got yeah. so bad that they released a biocontrol for that mm -hmm. on Magic Island just to help them manage it. Um, so if we can keep, we can have these little mini successes. We know that it's important. It gives us hope. We know that um, we can go into an eradication effort or rapid response, knowing that there is a possibility for us to have success. Um, the other thing that gives us hope is new innovations with technology and tools. Right now for Rod, they're working on a technology that can um, basically do an image slash heat mapping and read chemical, the chemical makeup of leaves in a forest. So what they're trying to find out is that even before an ohia tree exhibits those dead dying leaves, they want to find out if they can look at and find stressed leaves for ohia and get those trees out of the wind column much quicker. And wow. this is a brand new technology that's um, 
it's been used in other places of the world before. They've never used it for Ohia. So there's all kinds of new technology that comes out. Um, I said before about Little Fire Ant with it being an issue with organic farmers. Um, I should have clarified that within this past 12 months, they have had an approval of uh, a new um, treatment method that can be used um, and people can keep their organic standing. It's not as effective or efficient. So I should say efficient. It's effective. It's not as efficient as the pesticide, but it's something that they can use to control LFA. And it gives a lot of um, resources to these organic farmers. So yeah, um, the little wins that we get, the new technology. And another thing that gives us hope to be perfectly honest and not sound corny is um, hearing people understand more about invasive species, like the general public. 10 years ago, when you talked about invasive species, um, I guarantee you, you'd meet more people that didn't really know why it was important. 10 years later, um, I think people are starting to get uh, a little bit more of a better idea that it's not just about preserving trees. Um, it actually has an impact on our lives. So I think the general raise in awareness about invasive species is something that always keeps us going. Amazing, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that does, does give you hope. Thank so you. Help spread the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Spread, spread the word, quick one. I just sent a message, Tom, who's on this. Tom and I are returned Peace Corps volunteers. And there are about 1,400 of us across the islands, of which many are environmental types. And this talk, I mean, we, I need something to do because we're not doing much right now because of the stupid virus. But this is truly something I could set up if you would. I mean, I'll get the info from Morgan, but I think our group, because we're across all the islands, and I think it would be an awareness issue for everyone because we're all ages, we hike, we do, but a lot of them are environmentally concerned people, okay? So... Um, I'll get the info from Morgan, or I can send you mine via chat, but I think it would be a good idea. Tom, what do you think? Am I yeah. unmuted? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Great idea, Caroline, and thanks for taking the lead on that. And Aaron, I was, by, in my mind, I'm, I'm making notes as we're talking, just to contact you afterwards to see what I could do to volunteer and get more involved with this, but um, Caroline, that, that, that's a great idea. And also, Aaron, there's one Ohia tree in our neighborhood, and I live in Mona Lily, that has been just a gorgeous, beautiful specimen for years. It's dead very quickly. And I'm going to send you or call you and give you the, um, the, uh, the address of that property. That might be wor worth checking out. But um, yeah, Caroline, let's get, let's get involved with this. Yeah, I would love that. Um, so yeah, please feel free to um, email that information. I'm teleworking right now. So uh, you can email that. I'm checking my mail all the time. Okay. And as far as what you guys can do now and with the presentation, um, recently for the Hawaii Conservation Conference, uh, they had a virtual conference and the Invasive Species Committee's table at the virtual conference has um, a list of 10, what we call BOLO species, be on the lookout. That means the, these are things that are maybe present or you know, in limited distribution on one island but we absolutely don't want to see them on other islands. So the two-line spittlebug, Queensland longhorn beetle, uh, chromalina odorata or devil weed, these are all things that we want people to be on the lookout and there's um, their species that have a response already enacted for them. So if I, I mean, that might be a really great um, presentation for your group because it's statewide especially, um, but that information is on our website. That Bolo list. And then also for you hikers, we just started this new volunteer led. Um, we want to do trail surveys for devil weed. And this is a self directed volunteer effort. Our information for that is on our website. But basically, you um, do it on your own time. You dedicate one of your hikes, um, not just for enjoyment, but you will actually spend that hike on that trail looking specifically for this plant. And if you're interested, um, we can also provide you with a free lookalike guide because there's about um, three species that look very similar to this plant. Um, but you then send us your information about the hike. And if you find the plant, you pull it out. So that's one of those, you can do it kind of on your own time. And I think we've done since February, 
We've done over 80 miles of trail surveys. And we also work in conjunction with Conservation Dogs Hawaii. Um, they have scent detection dogs that can actually smell this plant, it's Promalina odorata. So it has a, a gasoline smell to it. So they'll take their dogs out and try and find any plants that we're not gonna be able to see from the trail. And then if they find a patch, we put that um, coordinate out on our Facebook group. And if you're available on the weekend, you go out and pull those plants. So. That is pretty cool. I definitely would like more information on that. I know there's a couple of hikers in here, so I'm sure getting the word out on that program would be good to do too. Great. Different people interested. Yeah. So you said that was on the um, your website. Oh, right? Yep, awahuis.org. Well, thanks, Erin, for sharing all of this information with us. I think that was really helpful. You know, we, through training, have gone through a lot of um, the invasive species of trees that we come across out in the field um, during our citizen forester mappings. But I think what you had to share really helped to be on the lookout for those species and know what to look for and even other species that we don't cover in our training. Um, really helpful. So thanks so much for sharing all this with us and sharing your resources. Absolutely. And um, contact me anytime. If, like I said, if I can't answer it, I'll find somebody who can. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy your, enjoy your time out with the trees. Sounds good. Thank you. Aloha. Wow.